All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 20th of August in the year of our Lord, 2023. Yes, I haven't made a video for a while. Because God's Word hasn't changed and the situation in the world hasn't changed, I guess. Uh, except we're getting ever closer to the return of Christ and the turmoil that precedes that. <laughs> so... Um, since most of the people that listen to this are Christians, born-again Christians, uh, and we have a difficult situation in this world. We, we are in the world, but not of it. Jesus said to his apostles, he said uh, uh, that he had called them out of the world, and you're not of the world, and therefore the world hates you. That's why Christians are hated. Born-again, Bible-believing Christians are hated by the world. Now, what I want to talk about today is a little bit about some of the words in the Bible, like world and sin, um, a little bit about uh, so-called original sin or original guilt and uh, total depravity. Uh, just briefly uh, talk a little bit about the problem we have because we work with a translation and also our minds are filled with understandings that we've been taught that aren't necessarily true and biblical. Uh, <clears throat> and even some of the references material, like you sometimes we'll see uh, an abbreviation TDNT, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Yeah, uh, but you should be aware that it was written by a Nazi. <laughs> You would think that, that that Christians would have a little more discernment about using n Nazis. And this is a guy that was active in Hitler's program for the Jews. Um, uh, yeah, one of the unfortunate... I would never have set, bought that volume uh, if I had... That set of volumes if I had known... Uh, who he, what the author was. And we have to be careful. The only book that the author is God is the Bible. And even then, like when we deal, deal with a translation, uh, even a good translation like the King James, uh, which has some dated issues, uh, is are we understanding what Jesus and the apostles actually said? Even if we were first century Palestinian Jews, uh, the, the problem is, it's spiritual, and the flesh does not receive the things of the Spirit because they're foolishness to it. You ever notice the world, you start telling them about Jesus Christ and the, the cross and, and God, and they just think it's a bunch of foolishness? They're just fulfilling the Scriptures. <laughs> it's proven all the time. But I want to look at this. I want to start with uh, Matthew chapter 7. I like to get a good context in because... The Word of God is more important than anything I say. And I'm, I'm just trying to... I am seeking to think biblically about things. And I've been a Christian for a number of years, born-again Christian. I have to figure it out. Let's see, when was I born again? 1976. Uh, so it's uh, just about September of 1976, I think. And it was God's work. It was not in a church. I wasn't responding to an altar call or anything like that. I was responding to the call of Christ through his Holy Spirit. I had been abiding under the uh, conviction of sin. You know, Jesus talked about uh, the parable of the soils, where the, the shallow soil, 
I think that is like people that respond. They, they, he says that when they hear the, the the word of the gospel, that they respond with joy, but they endure only for a while. They're they're uh, uh, they're on stony soil. There's no depth of soil. There's no moisture uh, reserve of moisture there. So as soon as things get up get difficult, like dry, as soon as the emotion goes away, and you start suffering a little bit of persecution, like people avoid you and people start whispering about you and things like that and criticize you because you believe in Christ instead of following after the world instead of believing the lies of the world and uh, that starts pretty soon uh, and continues <laughs> but uh, uh, that you they wither away if it's just emotion emotions are fickle they come and go uh, it has to have some deep roots and that the those deep roots are roots that have been planted and run deep by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, convicting you of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Once you realize your state, what you really are, it's basically what he does is he holds a mirror up to your face that this is what you are, and this is where you're going, and this is why. And you suddenly get very serious uh, and you don't have to be born again to cry out to God to save you because you do that out of self-interest when the Holy Spirit convicts you. Yeah, in the interest of your own eternal uh, uh, future. It's, it's not disinterested at all. Of course, that's the whole purpose of God, the Spirit of God convicting you. Now, unless you're a Calvinist. <laughs> then it's all decreed. Oh, well. And there's always the excuse, no matter what you say, well, God decreed you to say that. God decreed you not to believe, or God decreed you to... Except it's not the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach that. And I want to be about what the Bible teaches, not just about what somebody spins it to say. There's a lot of spinmeisters in this world. They do the same thing what they've done with the scriptures for millennia. So we're going to start, now this is the Sermon on the Mount, and let me preface this with a little caution, the result of over 40 years of being, what is it? Is that a calculator laying in here, Candy? No. I was born again in 1976, so what is that? It's too early in the morning to think uh, about math, <laughs> even subtracting. Uh, I have to do the same thing with my birthday. Let's see, how old am I this year? There's been so many of them now. Uh, fortunately, they grow less in importance. Another day older, another day closer to Christ. To his return. Either I'm going to go to him one way or the other. It's always to him, though. Whether we live, we live for the Lord. Whether we die, we die for the Lord. So, either way, it's okay. Uh, yeah, Christians shouldn't be concerned with the things of the world that much. The world is, is driven by fear, and Satan wants to keep it that way. Fear of, you know, why is health care, so-called health care, has nothing to do with health. It's called sick care, dying care. They really don't care about you at all. They care about your money. It's, it's, an, it's the health, the industrial, the, what is it, the... M Pharma, pharma, it's all about money, making money for them, not for you. They're not benevolent. You have to be born again to have any kind of true benevolence. But that's uh, a lot of the problem. But the devil wants to keep us confused. He wants us to think that this is a Christian country, for example. It's not. Never was. Christians have lived here, but a lot of most of what calls itself Christian in the world is not Christian. It's not really the gospel. That that's really the the telltale too, as far as Christian non Christian is what's the gospel? What's the gospel of Rome? Is it the same gospel as the, the apostles preached? But back to this to Sermon of the Mount, uh, Ch Matthew chapter seven here. This is given in the period of time before the cross and the resurrection. And Jesus speaks in parables and explains why he does. But it, it's because his primary purpose is to die on that cross. And if Satan and the enemies of Christ knew 
what God's mission in Christ was, they would not have crucified him. Because that is was the death knell of their empire, their rule. Yeah, that was the, uh, the even though Satan has not been destroyed yet, cast into the bottomless pit permanently, uh, yet his the sentence has already been passed. He's just waiting for the execution of that sentence, and he's trying to bring everybody with him he can, because he's full of hate, malice. But don't you know? You have to be around people. So Christians are so naive. We think, oh, that's he's a nice person or she's a nice person. Uh, they're wicked and sinful and everything else. It's it's just that. There is uh, people who, I believe the, the root of sin is self-centeredness, that that's what sin really is. Not instead of God-centeredness, you're totally self-centered because you've, you're dead, spiritually dead, because Christ isn't in you. And uh, so all you have in you, unless you're demon-possessed, is you. You're self-centered. That's all you have is yourself. And you act out of that. And there's such thing as enlightened self-centeredness where you've been educated that it is better for you in the long run if you don't do certain things and if you do do certain things. But people, charity, everything else, that the vast majority of the world does it out of self-centeredness because it pleases them. If you give to charity because it makes you feel good, you're just a hedonist. You do things because they make you feel good. That's... I guess all non... I don't know. Even masochists, even people that physically torture themselves, do it because it makes them feel good. People that eat hot chili peppers. Things like that. Uh, which I occasionally do. To my regret, but here, but I just want to warn you that because of the time that the, Jesus spoke these things, he's speaking uh, in parables. He speaks in a semi-concealed way, and then he explains it to his disciples. But even his disciples aren't really understanding here because they're they're not born again yet. The Holy Spirit is with them, but not in them. And it wasn't until after the death and resurrection of 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 Jesus that they he, their minds were over a period of time open because they still had biases and traditions and everything else it's just like what Jesus had to go what God had to go through to get Jesus to go to the house of Cornelius or Jesus Peter go to the house of Cornelius to preach the gospel and then to get the rest of them to accept what Peter did what do you mean you went to the Gentiles they're not God's people. Because Jesus had said, too, that during this period of time, his earthly ministry, that he was sent only for the Jews at that time. But God had a bigger plan that after Jesus accomplished, at the end of his ministry, the primary purpose of his ministry, the atonement for the sins of the world... Then, so when, when we under when we read uh, the the Gospels and Jesus' words, we have to look also at the teaching of the apostles in the rest of the New Testament to see how they understand what Jesus said, what they're teaching, so that we don't get a uh, a skewed view. This is one of the areas where dispensationalism is correct. Uh, not that they know what they're doing, but because you have to look at the Bible not just as a flat book, but as, you know, it's not all valid today. It doesn't mean it's not all true. It's just not like the Old Testament law. It is not valid for Christians. If you're a born-again Christian, you're not under the law, you're under Christ. And most of what's called Christianity does not understand the Bible. Well, they're not born again either, so, but we're going to look at that a little bit. 
So, uh, and some other things. So let me get on with it before I talk for an hour and a half and not say anything. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, by the wide gate. What's the narrow gate? Christ. Christ. Salvation is only in Christ. It's not only in an institution called that calls itself the, the one true church. No. Not in it's in Christ alone. He is the narrow gate and the narrow way. We are to walk in him. See, that's consistent with what we see in, say, the teaching of Paul. It's only by faith in Christ that we're saved. Not faith in, a, in the church. I know many people have known people, serious Catholics, for example, in, in laws, that uh, my sense is that they're from years of contact, was they trusted in the institutional church, the Roman Catholic Church, to be their salvation. That if they did what the church said, the church would get them to heaven after some purgatory. My father-in-law, who is passed now, looked forward to purgatory. So apparently so he could could atone for his own sins. I don't know. It's such a screwed up mess that most Catholics have no idea what the Roman Catholic Church actually teaches, and most of them don't believe what it actually teaches. And the ones that do believe what, they, what it actually teaches, they're even worse off. No, the church is not the Savior. That's, it has a false gospel. The gospel of Rome is the Roman Catholic Church. Outside the church, there is no salvation. They've said that for millennia. Well, that's a truism if the church is those who believe in Christ. But their idea of the church is man, a man-made institution which they will as, as insist. <laughs> well, wait a minute. This is, first of all, this is the Church of Rome. The church, seems to me the church started someplace like Jerusalem. So it wasn't, so why? <laughs> See, the, these, these people are usurpers. The, Rome was once a time an Orthodox church. So Paul wrote the, the epistle to it. And then they, well, sinful man corrupted it as they corrupt everything. So, so the narrow gate is Christ, uh, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets. Now, a prophet is someone who speaks in God's name, who claims to be speaking for God. Someone says, God told me this. Uh, in a sense, they're acting like a prophet. If God, and now a false prophet is one that God didn't actually say anything to. Or they twisted what God said. We don't need prophets today. Because we have the scriptures. The Holy Spirit enlightens us. The scriptures are sufficient for every good work. For the man of God. So you've got to be God's. Without God, nothing is sufficient. You're de uh, deficient because you don't have God in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, that's why Jesus said you must be born again, born of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, which is Christ. Uh, God must be in you, or you can't. Because, well, that gets to be. Why did God make us to be His temple? To be to be uh, the image of God, and to be the image of God requires God to be dwelling in you. What good is a temple without a deity? Nothing. An empty temple is worthless. It's an empty building. And since Adam's fall, humanity has been devoid of God's presence in them until Christ. If you're born again. Then you've been restored to a proper relationship with God, to God's proper purpose, and he does indeed dwell in you. 
But that only happened uh, at Pentecost after the death and resurrection of Christ. He had to pay for your sin. Otherwise, if the Holy Spirit took up residence in your mortal body, it would be a pile of ash, if any ash was even left. Because God is holy. As long as God will, does not abide with sin. So the sin had to be atoned for, had to be cleansed, had to be covered over with the blood of Christ. Somebody had to pay the penalty. It was either Christ or you. And it's still that way. Take your pick. Be beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They proclaim to be Christians. People like T.D. Jakes, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Rick Warren, many others, many others. Joel Osteen. I don't know, does he still have the biggest church in the United States? If they come promising you the things the world loves and wants, they're of the world. Yeah, it shouldn't be. They deceive multitudes. They deceive many people that, that are supposed to be born again, spirit filled Christians. You'd be most of those people are have been taken in by the prosperity gospel. All this nonsense. I thought there was supposed to be a gift of the discernment of spirits. Apparently, that work of the Holy Spirit is sadly lacking among Pentecostals and Charismatics. Huh, I wonder why. Because that movement is not of God. It's man. It's, it's emotion. It's, it's just like the old revivalism. You work people up, but it's not God. That's not, emotionalism is not the Spirit of God. Now, the Spirit of God working in you may bring forth strong emotions. May not. But the emotions are just the side effects, uh, not the thing itself. They, are, they come to you in sheep's clothing. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian all my life. God called me when I was nine years old. God healed me of this and healed me of that. But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. Give me a hundred dollars and God will bless you a hundredfold. Yeah, that stuff. They're ravenous wolves. They're seeking to devour you. They don't care about you. They don't love the brethren. They love themselves. That's why they take your money and buy themselves a brand new shiny jet airplane with it. Yikes. P.T. Barnum has said there's a sucker born every day, and they do put on a circus. Now, I suppose people nowadays uh, haven't lived when there were still circuses, but uh, yeah, under the big top. Oh, did you not remember the old revivals? They always had to have their big tents, too. Going from town to town, extracting money. There was a movie done about that, black and white film. Uh, uh, who was the famous actor that was in that? His name was Lancaster, I believe. That was the name of that. Uh, it was about revivalism and a phony preacher. Very true. Very true. They sort of hit the... Sometimes the, uh, the greatest attacks on the church can be done by people that simply show you what claims to be the church truly and because it's corrupt that's not christ church christ church is spiritual it's not visible yet not really visible uh some people that reduce baptists tend to reduce the church to a visible gathering no it's no it's more than that <sighs> And it's all God's people, all His, all Christians. The Jewish nation is not Christian, is not God's people. They are cut off because they don't believe in Christ. They're outside the covenant. There's only one covenant that can save you, and that is the new covenant, that is Christ Jesus. And outside of Him, there is no salvation. 
Not outside the Roman Catholic Church. Outside of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. There is no forgiveness of sins outside of him. There's only judgment. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from figs? Figs. Figs from thistles? Got ahead of myself. Even so, every, no, so he's, he's saying, obviously, false prophets don't produce good things. What do they produce? You cannot tell uh, if they drive around in a new Mercedes or or one of those Rolls Royce, gold-plated Rolls Royce or something. You know what they are. They're materialists. They display their sins like Sodom does, just openly, openly. And people gobble it up. Why? Because they want to be rich too. It's not about salvation. Just like, why do people come to America? For money. They think they can make more money here and have an easy life here. A Christian should avoid America. It's probably the most evil country in the world today. As far as the amount of evil it does, it does in the world, it's just bad. But Christians here sing hymns in church in praise of America. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. I think Christians should be a little more discerning and say, we're not going to sing that song anymore. It's not Christian. Or the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which was a uh, northern Civil War propaganda piece to encourage the troops to say they're doing God's work, killing their brothers and sisters in the South. That war doesn't solve problems. God could have ended slavery if people wanted to listen to him. No, the love of money. The love of the money is the root of all kinds of evil, including slavery. <sighs> and it's still practiced today. It's called contract law. Involuntary or draft. If they draft you into the military or whatever, it's involuntary servitude. Yeah. Christians join the military voluntarily. That's contrary to Scripture. Do not become servants of man. You're selling your, your soul to the United States for what? <sighs> Jeepers. Christ, you cannot... Christ is Lord... You can't confess that openly in the military and practice it. You can't say, I'm not going to do that because it's contrary to Christ. <laughs> I'm not going to shoot those people. Christ doesn't tell me to kill them. America is not God's kingdom. It's, it, it, people, see, the devil wants to blind not only the world, but Christians to confuse us about who we belong to and where our loyalty lies. Christians are so confused, even born-again Christians. Waving the American flag. You've been lied to from your, your youngest days. America's evil. It's always been evil. Every country's evil. There's only one kingdom that's not evil, and that's the kingdom of God. And Christ is king. If you're living in a country and Christ isn't the king, in fact, it's not his kingdom. The king's not there. You'll know them by their fruits. Men do not gather grapes from thorn bushes and or figs from thistles. Even so, every good tree, this is what I really wanted to get to, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruits. This is the words of God spoken by God in the flesh. <clears throat> Said a cannot, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. The 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 new 
as John said, teaches us in the New Testament, the new man and Paul, the new man, the new creation in us that God puts in us when we're born again, cannot sin. As John says, his, uh, his seed does not sin. It's our flesh that sins, what we got from Adam, not what we get from God. You haven't, haven't been born again, all you are is Adam. All you are is flesh. Paul used the word flesh to, to refer to Adam, the old man, sometimes called. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, why does a good tree bear good fruit? Because it's a good tree. Olive trees bear olives. Apple trees bear apples. Crab apple trees bear crab apples. Some is good fruit, some is bad fruit. You can see that it's the nature of the tree. Fallen humanity does not have God in them. They are corrupt and self-centered by nature. You're not a sinner because you have sinned. You sin because you're a sinner. You're born into that state because you're born of Adam. Just like being born into, if you're born in Ukraine today, you're born into a wicked Nazi country. Not your choice, not your fault. But you're part of it. Okay, uh, what I want to talk about, I already talked too much, is uh, I should have had that up. No, I, don't, I actually don't have to have it on the screen, do I? As long as I can read it. Go read the Bible yourself. Uh, actually, one of the reasons I sort of a take, taking a break for a while is I don't want you regular listeners to be dependent on me you need to be dependent on Christ not me I mean I might suggest things that you haven't thought of and be a little helpful maybe hopefully now and then but I'm not your savior But, but yet, on the other hand, in this age, you know, the scripture says that we should not neglect assembling ourselves together. We need to admonish and encourage one another, which seldom happens in church on Sunday mornings. <sighs> well, it does happen. I mean, it does. But uh, sometimes it doesn't. But it's, it, 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 we need, we're not alone in this world, in this lost and sinful world. We're not alone. We, God did not leave us alone. We have brothers and sisters in whom he dwells also. That's our fellowship with one another. That's why we can love people, truly love people with the love of God who we have never met. Because if they're born again and we're born to them, the same Savior is in both of us. The same Spirit is in all of us. That is our fellowship. That is our koinonia. It's not because we go to a certain building or uh, we live in a certain country or we read a certain version of the Bible or something like that or belong to a certain denomination. No, we belong to Christ. And his life is in us. His spirit is in us. That is our fellowship. He is our fellowship, our King, our God, our Savior. So... Uh, I needed to bring that back up, so I, I've got to read it. But, okay, so what is... We live in a fallen world that is under the dominion of Satan. Don't listen to the Calvinists. They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they, they make every evil thing the will of God, just to give you a clue if you don't know that. Uh, really, they do. It's, uh, so avoid that. It will kill you. It's, it's spiritual death. Uh, you, you'll become like them, not like Christ. I've been there, done that, and that wasn't good. I got pretty deep into it. As far as examining it, I mean, 
Actually, I believed it for a while until I found out they were not telling the truth. Uh, yeah, some of their are you got to watch out for their sneaky biblical arguments because they'll say one thing. Oh, the Greeks, watch out for a guy that says the Greek says this or the Greek says that if you're not able to check it out. Uh, sometimes, and I'll say the same thing here because I'm gonna de we're going to deal with some words that are a little bit of a problem for us. Uh, because English is not Greek and it's not first century Greek and even then spiritual things have to be understood spiritually. The Holy Spirit has to enlighten us. Not some Greek expert. But what I wanted to mention because here, like Jesus here when he's saying the good tree bears good fruit and the bad tree bad fruit. John chapter 3, you must be born again. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot perceive it. You cannot enter it. Uh, because you're a bad tree. You're A bad tree is every tree that comes from Adam. All the descendants of Adam are bad trees. Sinful. Because they are without God. The word sin, harmatia, uh, um, in the Greek... See, one of the problems we have is tradition has taught us certain things like sin. We, we're generally raised to believe that sin is a bad act, something that's con an act we do that's contrary to God's law in thought, word, or deed. No, that's just a manifestation of sin. Sins are just manifestations of sin. It's like the fruits on the tree. The fruit is just a manifestation, a temporary manifestation of that tree. The tree produces that fruit because it's that kind of tree. Sins are the product, the fruits of sinners. People who are in whom God does not dwell. People that are lost, fa fallen humanity as a whole, every single one is a sinner because they are devoid of God. The, the, word, uh, the word sin, the common word, harmatia, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but uh, has the idea... Uh, the, one of the primary ideas is like missing the mark, falling short, not being what you're supposed to be. It is a lack of something. Instead of sin being a, evil being a positive thing, it's actually a lack of God. Because only God is good. So if as Jesus said, only God is good. So if God is not in you, you can't be good truly. Not in the sight of God. We were created to be his image. Go back to Genesis 127. Let us make man in our image. To be the image of God requires the presence of God. To be the temple of God, another metaphor of what the church and Christians are, is to have God dwelling in you. Otherwise, you're just an empty building. So a good tree requires the presence of God. Jesus said you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. So, But the idea of, of sin being bad deeds rather than a lack of of a proper relationship with God, including him dwelling in us, lack of being in harmony with God, in, in partnership with God, in fellowship with God, sharing in God, us being his dwelling place. Without that, we can't fulfill his creative purpose of being the image of God. When people say, preachers say that, well, we're all the image of God. No, we're not. Fallen humanity is not the image of God because 
God doesn't look like they do. God is not evil like them. God is not like the drug pusher on the, in the street or the president in the White House. It doesn't look like them at all. They are devoid of God. They are of the devil. They are the children of the devil, as Jesus said. They're the, the, his offspring. He said the father of rebellion and the father of lies and murder. He was a murderer from the beginning. In the words of Jesus Christ. If you haven't been born again, Adam, after the fall, became a child of the devil. Fallen humanity is the result of them trusting Satan rather than trusting God. See, it was a lack of faith. Why is salvation by grace through faith? My opinion, because it was a lack of faith in God. They believed the words of the serpent and didn't trust in God. Adam, the scripture says, was not deceived. Eve was deceived. He deceived me. The serpents deceived me. Yeah. Adam wasn't. Adam chose. He could do what he did. He chose to act independently of God and do what God had forbidden. He cut himself off from God. And all the rest of us with it. Because God determined that to shut all humanity under sin. You're not born innocent and become a sinner. You're born a sinner. You're born devoid of God. Because the root of sin is self-centeredness. And you will be self-centered if God isn't in you, because that's all that's left is yourself. We are not proper human beings without God dwelling in us. Because we're made for that relationship of being his image, his temple, his agent, his children, his interface with creation. Just like Jesus Christ was and is the God-man. He is the second Adam, and we'll all be perfectly, all his people will be perfectly conformed to his image when he appears. If you're in heaven right now, you're not perfectly conformed to his image. You're, you're without your sinful flesh, but you left that behind, but you have not received your glorified body. You're not like him, as you shall be. I'm going by what the scripture teaches. Paul taught this. All right, so one thing I want to, there, there's some words that we have trouble with. One is sin. Uh, there's another word that's sometimes translated trans, trespass, which means to go too far or go beyond, like trespassing on somebody else's property, going where you don't belong. But the, the usual word means uh, to miss the mark, basically, to fall short, to fall short of the glory of God. Well, what's the glory of God? The scripture says Jesus Christ is the glory of God. The image of God. He is the very image of God. And that's what we're supposed to be. To be less than that, and we're born less than that, means you're a sinner. Means you're fallen. Means you're not fulfilling God's purpose in the creation of man, which we created in Adam. So you're, you're born a fallen son or daughter of Adam. And you inherit his problems. His lack of a proper relationship with God. God, you're not born with God in you. That's your problem. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. So that's, we need to understand sin that way. It's not imputed guilt. It's not that Adam's sin is imputed to you. No, the consequences of Adam's sin you carry. It's not that you did wrong, therefore you became a sinner. Adam did wrong, and therefore you became a sinner, <laughs> because you're of him. You are born of his flesh. And without the Spirit of God, that's all you are. And that's the problem. Sin, as is self-centeredness, is the lack of God in you. All you are is self, which is a good thing if you're in proper relationship with God. It's a necessary thing. 
but deprived of God's presence, you're dead spiritually, and you can't be anything other than self-centered, and that's it. That's really the root of sin, from my understanding of Scripture. Now, it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. But those are simply the fruit of the tree. You're born a bad tree, a bad seed of corrupt man. And you have to be reborn, born again, of God. That you can become what God created man to be. And that's in Christ. And he will fully glorify us with Christ when Christ returns. Okay, so, so sin, when we see that word, again, we've been raised thinking sinful acts. And go, God, how can God uh, condemn us for our, Adam's guilt? You know, we inherit Adam's guilt. No, we don't. We inherit the consequences of Adam's sin. But God chose to shut all people under sin in that way in order that, quoting the scripture here, that he might have mercy on all. Not just on descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or something like that. No, Christ died for the sins of the whole world. All who turn to Christ, who call upon the Lord for salvation shall be saved truly call upon him to be saved okay so that was one of the, the the things that I wanted to deal with the concept of sin that gets into original sin what it you know it, because there's been a lot of misinformation on that by people that really don't know what they're talking about a lot of theology ungodly theology mixed in but it, it's not that you're you're guilty because what somebody else did you you inherit the fallen condition of being uh, separated from God from somebody else but God has made provision in Christ for that you to be restored to the proper relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ so God is not unjust and God does not decree some to be saved and some not to, because he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Come, all men to come to repentance, all human beings. For you, those of you that don't understand English, or most other languages, <laughs> where man is, can be generic, unless its context indicates otherwise. Oh, my. We live in a strange world. And people are determined to make it stranger because they're children of the devil. The devil wants to blind your eyes, and so do his children. Okay, so uh, what's the other? Uh, the idea of sin and well, original sin too. It's really it's it's the lack of God's presence, lack of God dwelling in you, lack of you actually being His occupied temple. So Adam sort of drove God out. He chose, I don't want you anymore. I'm going to follow the devil. It's really what he did. He chose to not obey God, to act independently of God. He, instead of being trusting God, he decided not to trust God and trust himself in his own judgment. Or trust his wife or whatever. But it wasn't God he trusted when he acted, and he acted knowingly. He wasn't not, he, the scripture says he was not deceived. He made a choice. And it affected all his descendants. But Jesus came to fix the mess. And that work has begun. Now in this age, we are born again through faith in him. But not everyone. And when he turns back, comes back, then he will begin the work of the restoration of not only uh, humanity, but also creation, which has been grossly affected by the fall. 
because of the position man was supposed to be in of uh, having dominion over the earth and the creatures of the earth. When man fell, they corrupted everything else, too. We're not given a whole lot of information, but we're told, Paul says, that the creation itself groans in anticipation, uh, eagerly waiting the, uh, the, the revelation of the sons of God. Because creation itself will be set free from its corruption, from what we call in physics, I guess, entropy. The law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, where everything is, is corrupt, subject to decay. Uh, sim oversimplification, but that's what it is. Everything is, it's like everything is running down. It's not, it doesn't endure. It's not eternal. It's, it's decaying. Just like our bodies are, our mortal bodies. So that's uh, if if we understand that properly, that it's the lack of the presence of God in us. Then what Jesus says about being born again makes sense. You know, it all the scripture all fits together. It's just that we have a tough time grasping how it fits together. And some of the things they teach us aren't helpful, like sins uh, being individual acts, and that was make, really makes us was guilty rather than simply manifestations of the underlying problem, which is being deprived of the proper relationship with God that we're supposed to have. And, but God has made provision for that problem to be solved in Christ. By his grace, it's a, eternal life is a free gift of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. Free gift. Now, if you try to buy it, you try to make a deal with God, you, tr you put your faith in something other than Christ, you don't get it. Christ alone. God will not allow us to add things or subtract things. It's Christ alone. If your faith is in Christ plus your good works, like John Piper, you're out. Read the book of Galatians. You cannot add your works uh, to Christ. As a basis for your being saved, being right with God. Because you don't have any good works. And they wouldn't make up for your evil anyway. See, it's it's a relationship. The issue, and this is why, the idea of being a born again Christian, used to be much more understood until they commercialized it, until the culture corrupted it like it corrupts everything else. Uh, and, and Christian bookstores became T-shirt warehouses, Je selling Jesus junk. The love of money corrupts everything. <laughs> But no, it's, it's that relationship, a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is all about. Being reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ and God taking up residence in you. And you're entered into a, a personal, eternal relationship with God restored to what Adam was supposed to be, Christ being the second Adam the progenitor of a new race which you enter into when you're born again. As God puts a new creation in you. Now while we're in this world, living in these bodies, we still have sin in us, with us, in our mortal body. Because this is Adam's body. So we await the redemption of our bodies. Uh, and Christ is the gospel. His death in our place for our sins. And through that, God has made it possible for us to be saved in spite of our sin. Because Christ already paid the penalty in full. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ.
Believe what God has said. God desires all people to be saved, but we're saved by His grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, personal faith in the living Lord Jesus, and nothing else.